Do you remember this one? With the logs and the exponentials. I hope you're starting to get the hang of this now. So instead of drawing two diagrams, I've just done the one that we want. The one with the arrows pointing from left to right. Let's write down an integral expression, ready to put the limits on. Here it is with the reversed order. I've also dispensed with the red brackets now. Hopefully you don't need those to picture things anymore. The outer integral is for y. Look at our diagram. The arrows start at y equals 1 and continue upwards until y equals 8. Those will have to be the limits for the new version of the integral. Let's put them on. The foot of the arrows is on the y-axis. That's where x equals 0. So x equals 0 must be the lower limit for the inner integral. Let's put that one on as well. OK, just one to go. The head of the arrows is on the curve y equals e to the x. We need to describe that as x equals some function of y. We should know how to do that by now. Let's write down y equals e to the x and then take logs to base e of both sides. If y equals e to the x, x is ln of y. That will be the, our top limit for the x integral. I'll put it in now and then this integral is finished. OK, that's it. There's something I'd like you to think about for these last two examples. When the curve was y equals x squared, we had to change it over to x equals root y. That's the inverse function for x squared. Similarly, in this example, y was e to the x, and we had to use the inverse function log y. That's a general principle in these problems that we'll usually have to find the inverse function in order to change the limits. Let's now move on to the last example involving sine x. This one has a real sting in the tail. This was the integral. The inner integral was y. y runs from 0 to sine x. And x runs from 0 to pi. We'll draw this now and prepare the new integral expression underneath as usual. Here's the new diagram with the arrows passing from left to right. And I've prepared the new integral expression, this time at the top of the page. This situation is a little bit different to what we've met before. There's a problem here. These arrows run from the curve and finish also on the curve. That's going to cause a bit of a hitch. We'll have to think carefully about it. Before we deal with that, though, let's do the easy bit. The outer integral is the y integral. That's got to run from 0 up to 1. We can put those limits on easily now. By this point, we should also have learned that we need the inverse function for sine. If y is sine x, then x is inverse sine y. Let's write that down. The sting in the tail I mentioned before is connected with the domain and range of these functions. The domain of inverse sine is 0 to 1. That's OK. That's what we've got for our y values. But the range is only 0 to pi by 2. That will only take halfway across the curve, as far as pi by 2. It won't get us to the far side. We could use inverse sine of y as the lower limit for our inner integral. And that'll start us off in the right place, on the left-hand side of the curve. The trouble is, we don't know how to describe, yet, the right-hand side of the curve. Where do the arrows finish up? It's still the sine curve, but the right-hand side can't be inverse sine of y because the values of x there are bigger than pi by 2, out of the range of inverse sine. We need to invent a way of getting round this. Let's put the inverse sine in for the bottom limit of the integral, at least. OK, there it is. We've now successfully coded in the foot of all our, all our red arrows. We need somehow to tell the integral about where the heads are. The secret is to use the symmetry of the sine function. Look at the following diagram. Here I've shown a value y corresponding to an x value inverse sine of y. The x value has the correct value between 0 and pi by 2. Now let's look at the other side of the diagram. I've drawn a symmetric situation. My diagram's not perfect, but if I'd drawn it perfectly, the tops of the two blue rectangles would be equal. The left-hand side has a width inverse sine of y, and so the right-hand rectangle must also have that width. 
If the rectangle has that width, that means that the x-coordinate of the point corresponding to the corner of the rectangle on the curve is just pi minus inverse sine of y. That will be the x value we need for the top of our integral. Let's mark it in. OK, there it all is. And there at the top is the final version of our integral. I hope this demonstrates to you that while on the whole reversing the region of integration is not particularly difficult, you do sometimes have to be alert for possible subtleties of this kind. This concludes my presentation on this subject.